Okay, welcome to today's sermon. It is the third week of Easter. I know it doesn't feel like the third week of Easter, but it is the third week of Easter, and the title, as you can see, is Today or Tomorrow from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 32. Jesus says lots of seemingly impossible things. He told the disciples to fear not. He told the disciples to doubt not. And he told them today's thing that I think is pretty important for us as we live in the COVID-19 experience of shelter at home. It'll be the topic because I wrote a whole lot of things Monday when I was in my sermon prepping time. It'll be the topic today and the topic next week. Here's what Jesus told them. He tells them this in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, don't worry. Unfortunately, he doesn't tell them also to be happy. He says, don't worry. I mean, is Jesus serious about this? Has he seen the way we're living currently? Does he understand what's going on? I mean, what am I supposed to do as a pastor on the screen? Just scream really loud and go, don't worry. Jesus said, stop it. Or am I supposed to use my counseling voice and go, I know it's hard. I know it's tough. Wish I could help more. But Jesus said to stop worrying, so stop it. I don't think that's going to go well. It's going to go about as well as the average spouse coming home from work or coming back to the house and the other spouse is very upset about something and you listen and you're really careful about listening and then you tell them that it's silly that they should feel that way and they should feel a different way. You should expect something thrown at you when that happens. It's probably not going to go well. The people that Jesus was speaking to in the Sermon on the Mount knew about worry. They didn't know where they were going to eat. That's why the feeding of the 5,000 is such a big deal. They don't know what they're going to eat. They don't know what their future involves. They don't know if they're going to be safe. The average male lived to be about 35, maybe 40 years old. It wasn't exactly the most worry-free, carefree experience. And Jesus speaks to them, speaks clearly to them and says, don't worry. He doesn't give them a 12-step program. He doesn't even give them a three-point sermon. He just says, don't worry. So what do we do with that? If Jesus is right next to you right now and turned and looked at you and said, Child, I need you not to worry. It's going to be okay. You would believe Jesus. And then you go off and do something and within three minutes you would come running back to Jesus and say, I can't help it, Jesus. Have you seen the world we're living in? This is what happened to the disciples. This is the everyday experience for the disciples. This is, probably, this is why most scholars believe the Sermon on the Mount in some form was preached over and over again by Jesus. Over and over again, he has to tell the disciples not to worry. He has to tell the crowd not to worry. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, the Sermon on the... Chapter 5 through chapter 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. It is respected in all faith traditions, not just Christian. And it starts with these words that are not very pastoral counseling friendly. He tells them not to love money. Okay. He says, therefore, I tell you not to worry. He's just told them in before this, don't worship money. But don't worry. And unfortunately, there is no be happy. The fully human, fully divine Jesus says, do not worry. What are they supposed to do with this? Okay, so how do we stop worrying? It seems to be wired into how we function. I mean, I know I'm a follower of Jesus, but there's lots of things to be worried about. What about the people who aren't followers of Jesus? Now, in fairness, this is before the resurrection. We know this as a resurrection and Jesus lived and died and rose from the dead. But don't worry continues and says, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. 
Jesus gets to the heart of the issue. The issue is the future. Whether it's three days from now, three years from now, 30 years from now, your worry is about the future. It's about something that's going to happen. In the first century, the main worries were food, drink, and clothes. That's why Jesus chooses them. Now, if Jesus were preaching this to us today, it might be, how am I going to pay tuition? I know they've deferred my student loans and there's some things I need to do, but those still are going to be really, really expensive and I don't know what to do. And can you imagine what health care cost is going to be in the future? And I don't know if you know this or not, Jesus, but there's COVID-19 and I'm worried about the health of my family and the, my health. And I'm worried about my marriage during this because I'm spending so much time with my spouse that I don't know what to do with that. Some of you are like, well, I'm never going to get married because we're going to be in a shelter at home forever. And some of you are like, am I allowed to get married again? And how do I deal with that? You're worried about your kids or your grandkids or your parents or your grandparents. Some of you are wondering if you'll ever get to have kids or you'll ever get to see your grandchildren again. You're worried about your finances. Some of you wish there were some finances. Your car payment, how are you going to make your car payment? Retirement. It sounds like a pie in the sky thing now. Some of you are like, well, I can't even, I'm retired and I can't even afford to live now. How's it, how am I going to function in the future? Jesus would say the same thing to us that he said to the disciples. Don't worry about the things that are happening in the future. We need to put things in their proper place. Jesus continues his sermon and says, Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? And of course, the people in the first century would go, Duh, of course, Jesus, you're right. If Jesus were saying this in the 21st century, he'd probably say something like, Is not your life more than just the things you worry about? Not that you've chosen bad things to worry about. You probably have perfectly legitimate things to worry about. But Jesus says your life should be more than the things you worry about. Even during COVID-19 pandemic, life is bigger than the things you worry about. If we're honest with ourselves, we know that. But if all we do is focus on the worries that we have, we'll continue to move in the direction of those worries. We'll continue to move in that direction and not accomplish what we really want. An overused phrase that people of my generation of seminarians use a lot is this. Direction, not intention, determines your destination. If all you can do is focus on your worries of things in the future that, quite frankly, you can't do anything about, then you're not going to accomplish what you really want. You may want to accomplish something amazing in the world, but if you continue to move in the direction of your worries, it's not going to matter. Direction that you're currently taking, not the direction you want to take, but the direction you're currently taking is going to determine where you end up. Now Jesus continues his Sermon on the Mount and he gets a little flower child and he, a little more flower child than I'm comfortable with and he says, look at the birds of the air. This is probably good I wasn't there. I would have been like, seriously Jesus, the birds of the air? I have things to do, like take care of my sick family. Like, figure out how we're going to live. Like, f try to figure out what church is going to look like. There's bills. There's day-to-day -day things. I don't have time to look at the birds of the air, Jesus. I mean, really, there's a virus going on that we don't have a cure for, or we don't have a treatment for. The birds of the air? Jesus, in the 21st century, we have pollution and global warming. The birds might want to worry about themselves. The birds of the air, what are you talking about? I don't want to be disrespectful, Jesus. But the birds of the air? Now, I'm sure that many of the people who were sitting there listening to Jesus on this hill, this big hill, but this hill, probably thinking the same thing I was thinking, just in a first century perspective. They were like, birds of the air? 
Those are just distractions we have where we distract ourselves from how horrible our life is. The birds of the air were the equivalent of your cell phone and your TV screen. As Barbara Brown Taylor often refers to, the adult pacifiers that we use to help us through our daily lives. Birds were simply a first century distraction. Jesus is saying there's more to it than that. Now maybe the people scattered on the hillside weren't as concerned as I am, but imagine they are on a hillside. They can see birds and Jesus is just talking about them. Then he says, They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Jesus is not arguing that we need to just stay around and learn to fly. Jesus is not arguing you ignore your bills. Jesus is not arguing you should pretend like the future doesn't exist. Jesus is not arguing that you should skip the application for a new job or skip the application for school. Jesus wants us to take a better perspective of what we can do today. Jesus is saying we have an extraordinary advantage over nature. Birds, as far as we can tell, can't plan their future. They can't plan for retirement. They can't plan for where they're going to go on vacation. They just go on vacation. You have the opportunity to sow now, to do things now, and reap the benefit of that later. Now, some of you are thinking, well, I made a bunch of bad decisions, and I keep making bad decisions. Yes, but the decisions you make today can help with those bad decisions you made previously so that your future looks better. But you have to focus on the now and the sowing so that you can reap what you need to. Do not miss the point that Jesus says, are you not much more valuable than the birds? God takes care of the birds. God knows what you need. God has the, his, your best interest in mind. And then he gets a little preacher nasty and he says, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Whoa. Okay, Jesus. So basically, I'm just not supposed to worry because I'm going to die sooner. I don't need to give you the studies on this. Worrying does take time off your life. But Jesus is making clear, if worrying was going to add to your life or add to someone else's life, it'd be okay. There is no benefit to worrying. We all know Jesus is right. But we don't like the answer. We don't like to ponder it. We don't like to deal with it. And then Jesus continues. He says, And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow and they do not labor or spin? These are people who did not have the experience that you have in which you, after a while, can gather up enough clothes and take them somewhere to donate them for other people who don't have clothes. These people just had a few amount, a very limited amount of clothes. Clothes were hard to come by. Unless, of course, in history your name was Solomon. Which is why Jesus continues and says, Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Solomon is like a superhero of the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Solomon was wealthy beyond measure. He may have been a bad king. We can talk about that another time. But he was wealthy beyond measure. And he was famous even among people who weren't Jewish. But how wealthy he was. So when Jesus mentions Solomon, everyone perks up and goes, Oh, that would be like in my subculture mentioning a Marvel superhero. Maybe in your subculture make, mentioning a place you go on vacation or mentioning an actor or a TV show. All would have perked up. Then he continues and says, If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here, tomorrow, here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Now Jesus gets to the heart of the matter here. Jesus' analogy is brilliant. If God is concerned about the grass of the field, which I'm now concerned about thinking about this text, the grass of the field that's here now and burned tomorrow... How much more concerned is God about you? Do you think that God cares? That's really his question. Do you trust God? 
And then Jesus, probably feeling this is a little over the top, does something to lower the tension that we miss reading it in English. In the English translation we miss because what we know is verse 30 finishes with, you of little faith. When we hear that phrase, as it's most commonly used in the biblical text, it's a semi-derogatory phrase of, come on guys, get it together. I'm tired of teaching you the same things. That's probably not how it was meant to be used this time. Quickly, let me try not to bore you with original language and academic geek stuff. Jesus is speaking in Aramaic. He speaks in Aramaic, common language of the day, but to have something written down, they wrote it into Greek. Now, usually that's not a problem. Aramaic to Greek was not a complicated translation as far as we know. I can't do it, but I understand it's not that complicated. But there are occasions where it becomes tricky. There's occasions where you have to take some license because of how things are used, because we can't detect sarcasm, we can't detect tone of voice, those kind of things. Matthew is, has the task of trying to take this phrase, you of little faith, and convey what Jesus was saying. So we translate it, you of little faith, because it's really the best way to translate it and so you can read it. But probably the best way, based on how Matthew combines a bunch of Greek words, is you little faithers, you. And if you find that is kind of amusing, then you get what Jesus was trying to do. He's just trying to point out that, really, guys? The issue is trust. Do you trust that God has your best interest in mind? When you wake up in the morning, do you trust that God has your best interest in mind? When you go to bed at night, do you trust that God has your best interest in mind? Now, Here's where it comes down to the rubber meets the road as we speak about. A phrase that I use often would fit into this context of Jesus' world. I get asked about God's will and where we fit into God's will, and I say, when you do not know exactly what to do, do the things you know to do. One of the things we talk about in student ministry a lot is 95% of God's will, because we get asked, what, what's God's will for my life? What am I supposed to do? 95% of God's will is in the biblical text. All you have to do is read it. Now, some of it in the biblical text is hard to figure out, and you will have to make some decisions about, should I marry this person? Should I date this person? Should, where should I go to school? What job should I do? Okay, but 95% of God's will is already there. So until you get a clear implication of what you're supposed to do, you do the things you know you're supposed to do. If you believe God has your best interest in mind, and maybe you don't, maybe that's the issue, but if you believe that God has your best interest in mind, then you do the things you know you're supposed to do. Because if we're not careful, we will grab the worries and the concerns of the future, we will pull them into today when we are not equipped and not prepared to handle them, and we will overwhelm ourselves. Do the things you know you're supposed to do today. And do them as well as you can. And then the other things may seem more obvious. Now Jesus continues on and says, So do not worry. Once again, it's not the 12-step program. It's do not worry. Saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Once again, these were the main concerns of the first century. Your concerns may be different. Jesus would say the same things. And then he says, For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Before I talk about the pagan phrase and try to sum this together for you, I need you to see that Jesus says your heavenly Father knows what you need, knows that you need them. Your heavenly Father knows what you need in the future. Your Heavenly Father knows what you need to do now so that you will have a better future. Be careful not to pull the things from the future into your life now or you will struggle. Jesus says, for the pagans run after these things, which sounds like a really, really negative term. In that context and at that time, pagan simply meant someone who was not a follower of God in their tradition. So everybody who wasn't like them. The reason the Ten Commandments were written 
was not so we'd have very specific rules to follow. The reason the laws were passed down were not so we had all these rules to follow. It was so the people who followers of Yahweh would appear different to everyone else. Jesus is just expanding upon that idea and saying, I don't want you to act like people who don't believe in me. Don't believe in God. Don't believe in Yahweh. The pagans in this time period were people who believed in all the mythological gods, believed in emperor worship, believed in mystery religion, believed in more gods than you can even imagine. They were the people who ran away when the plagues hit, when the Christians stayed and trusted. They were the ones who believed, well, that's just the way life's going to be because the gods don't love me, and they believed in fate. And they just gave up. Christians didn't do that, and it made them seem different. Jesus is basically saying, quit acting like everybody else. If you're really a Christian, you should be different. If you're really a follower of me, a little Christ, then you should act differently. The amusing part about this, as we see in, in Christian history, is the term pagans could be applied to being atheists. Because the term atheist in the first couple centuries meant different than what it does today. We refer to as an atheist today as someone who does not believe there is a God. We even have the term the new atheists. Christopher Hutchins, Stephen Hawkins, all that group. To be an atheist in that time period meant you believe there was only one God, or you overemphasize one God over the other thousands of them. Pagans believed in all kinds of gods. The followers of Jesus believed in one. Which reminds me of the classic story that I will finish with today, the Away with Atheist story involving Polycarp. Polycarp was one of the early church fathers, and he has a really cool name in English, Polycarp. He may have heard John the Apostle speak. He was a student of Papias, who clearly heard John the Apostle speak. Polycarp may have spoken to eyewitnesses of the resurrection. He became famous as a well-known speaker, a well-known thinker, who helped many of the Christians try to process what it meant to be a Christian before there were hymnals, before there were churches, before there were seminaries, before even the Bible was collected as we know it. But Polycarp would always find himself in areas that were facing severe localized persecution, in areas where there was an emphasis on emperor worship, because every person was required once a year to go and offer incense and say, Caesar is Lord. This is a major controversy for the Christians early on. It's a major problem for them for the first hundred years of, of Christianity. Of What about people who pretended to be followers of Caesar but really followed Jesus? Do we let them in the church? Do we not? Polycarp stood up and said, no, we don't. No, we, we don't offer incense to Caesar. This gets him reputation, and depending on who was emperor, this causes a problem, and he goes into hiding because he's forced into hiding because the people don't want to lose him. It almost sounds like a spy novel when you study the history of this. But one of the followers of Jesus turns him in in an almost like a Judas-like reaction, and he's put in prison for a significant amount of time, and and they don't, the Roman officials don't want to kill him because he's an older man. We, we don't know how old he was, but we know that he was definitely elderly. For the time period, he was very elderly. And he gets put in front of everyone on display as to be killed. And they don't want to do it because it makes them look bad. And they, the pro council in one account says, just curse Christ and we will let you go. And Polycarp, with the famous phrase, says, 86 years I have served him. He has never done me wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? And they were like, okay, okay. We don't want to kill you. How about you just say that Caesar is a genius or his spirit is powerful? Polycarp won't do that because it would lower the place of Jesus. Then he's threatened with beasts coming to eat him and kill him. He's like... Let it be. He says, I'm not going to do that. And then they threaten to burn him, which is probably what happens. And he says, you threaten fires that burn for an hour and are over, but the judgment of the ungodly is forever. 
He may have even been stabbed because the fires weren't killing him quick enough, depending on what account you have. What we do know from all of the accounts of the time period, Polycarp was never heard to be worried about what was going to happen, to be concerned about his future, even though he had every reason to be afraid and every reason to be worried. He doesn't worry himself to death. He trusts in a God who lived and died and rose from the dead and has his best interest in mind and knows what's going to happen in his future and is preparing him for that future. Polycarp took care of what he was supposed to do today and left the rest up to God. Jesus said, therefore do not, I tell you, do not worry. Take care of what you're supposed to today and the future will take care of itself. Don't take care of what you're supposed to do today. That's a bigger issue and you can take that up with Jesus. Take care of what you're supposed to do today. So today, so that you can reap what God has for you in the future. Or the cliched phrase, focus on the direction you're moving, not where you would like to be, but where you're actually moving, because that's going to determine your destination. Stop worrying is really easy to say and so hard to do. I get that. That's why next week will be another sermon about worry. I'll finish Jesus's Sermon on the Mount and add some things and give you some more practical things to work with. But right now, I just want you to focus on the direction that you're moving. And right now, are you letting worry overwhelm you so you can't do the things you know you're supposed to do? You're living in fear, in depression, and in worry. That's not how God intended you to live. That's not why Jesus died for you. That's not the direction God wants you to go. Perhaps we should trust that God is big enough to do what God said. Let me pray for you and and then we'll try to figure out all together how we do this. Let's pray. In Jesus' name, I just pray right now thanking you that you spoke words that (laughs) they seem impossible. I don't know how anyone would do this stuff. But they did. The apostles overcame their worry. All the other people who were with Jesus overcame their worry. Polycarp overcame worry. There are countless stories throughout Christian history of people who overcame their worry. And if I had faced half the things they faced, I would have worried myself to death. Help me to remember that I don't need to drag the things of my future into my today and overwhelm myself. Help me to trust that you know what's best for me and I will do what I need to do each day to serve you. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.